All right. Good morning. Since August of last year, Joe Biden has been trying to get a Ukraine supplemental passed in the House specifically. Republicans, however, just like Donald Trump, when he's on trial, it's all about delay, delay, delay. But now it looks, it looks like the Ukraine supplemental finally made it out of the Rules Committee and members of the House will vote today on rules for debate surrounding a $95 billion, $95 billion foreign aid supplemental that involves Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. This procedural vote is expected to pass later today, which means tomorrow on Saturday, the House will finally vote on three single-subject foreign aid bills. $61 billion for Ukraine, another bill giving $15 billion to Israel, $9 billion in humanitarian aid to the Palestinians, and then a third bill providing $8 billion to Taiwan and its neighbors to defend against China. But... Despite fighting between Iran and Israel escalating early this morning, all eyes will be on the vote for Ukraine. We kind of know that Israel will get its funding. We're also certain Ukraine is going to get its funding. But which Republicans will vote for Ukraine? And the real question is, Will the aid to Ukraine arrive too late? Ukraine could fall in a month, possibly two weeks. So says Michael McCall, the Republican chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, who testified yesterday before the House Rules Committee, urging panel members to release the $61 billion Ukraine supplemental so it can get voted on tomorrow before a full House where it is expected to pass. That Ukraine supplemental passed in the Senate two months ago, two months ago with overwhelming bipartisan support. Joe Biden has been ready to sign it since August, but thanks to Mike Johnson, until today, it has been languishing in the House. And the question again is, Will it be too late? We know there is a pro-Putin wing of the Republican Party that has done everything it can to stall passage of the supplemental because the longer it takes for Ukraine to get much-needed American weapons, the more territory Vladimir Putin gets to seize. Right now, Putin has control of much of the Donbass region. Kharkiv, Ukraine's second largest city, has been evacuated with Russian troops surrounding it, and some say there's a distinct possibility Kharkiv could fall. Nebraska Republican Don Bacon warned, unless the Ukraine supplemental passes on Saturday, it's only a matter of weeks until Russia marches through Kiev. And Democrat Jim McGovern from Massachusetts. He's the ranking member of the Rules Committee. Jim McGovern warned last night that even if we do get the weapons to Ukraine, Republicans took too long to take this vote, and it might now be too late. As I said, President Biden has been trying to get this supplemental passed since August of last year. If, if Ukraine falls, it will be the Republican Party's fault. Specifically, Speaker Mike Johnson's fault. He has held the gavel for six months and up until this week has done everything he can to hold off bringing the supplemental to the floor for a vote even though he always knew it would pass. But, but yesterday, 
Speaker Mike Johnson shocked Washington by offering up, finally, a full-throated endorsement of the Ukraine supplemental. It was the first time in six months as Speaker that he urged Congress to vote for it. And now, Saturday, if all goes as planned, it will be the first time he's allowing the supplemental to get voted on. So why Mike Johnson's sudden shift? Is it because he heard CIA Director William Burns testify behind closed doors that without the supplemental, Ukraine is about to fall? Did it finally sink in that Russia is about to win and he, Mike Johnson, will be responsible? John Johnson yesterday sure sounded that way. It sure sounded like, wait a second, this is going to be my fault. It sure sounded yesterday like he is now terrified that Ukraine is about to fall and he knows it's all because of him, which it is. Or is Mike Johnson finally getting around to pushing for the supplemental because he knows it's too late? Because he knows that it's finally safe to give Ukraine the weapons it needs because he dragged his feet long enough and now it's impossible for Putin to lose. I don't know what Speaker Mike Johnson is thinking. I do know he takes his marching orders from Donald Trump, who takes his marching orders from Vladimir Putin. I also don't know what's really happening on the ground in Ukraine. I do know that the only way to convince Americans to support a $60 billion supplemental is to scare us into believing Russia is about to win. I also know $60 billion is a lot of money for our weapons contractors. And the louder politicians scream about Russia about to win, the more lavish their campaign contributions from Boeing and Raytheon will become. So, is Ukraine on the brink? I don't know. But what I do know is Russia's not on the brink. We all thought that Ukraine would be Vladimir Putin's proverbial quicksand, that his invasion of Ukraine more than two years ago would result in Russia getting bogged down in a proxy war with the United States the same way the Soviets got bogged down in a proxy war in Afghanistan that many say is the real reason the Soviet Union collapsed. When the Ukraine invasion began, the West convinced us that this would destroy Putin and that as casualties mounted, Russian citizens would demand his resignation. We were convinced that the Russian military would stage a coup and remove him. Well, except for the Wagner Group's short-lived rebellion, none of those predictions ever came to pass. Vladimir Putin is as strong today, maybe even stronger than he was before the invasion. Economic sanctions against Russia aren't working. The International Monetary Fund predicts that the Russian economy will grow by 2.6% this year. Why? Because of the war. Because of Putin's increased spending on weapons. Turns out, America isn't the only economy that profits off war. According to The Guardian, Russia's military-industrial complex has created more than half a million new jobs manufacturing weapons since the invasion. 2.5% of the Russian population is now working inside weapons plants. Europe, NATO, 
Well, they can't compete with Russia's war mobilization as Putin is refitting factories, turning them into defense contractors. You might remember that in order to join NATO, a nation must promise to spend 2% of its entire GDP on weapons. Russia is now spending close to 8% of its entire GDP on weapons. For the first time since the Soviet Union, Russia now spends more on weapons than it does on its social safety net. But the social safety net is not needed as much these days, especially since war with Ukraine has proven too good for the Russian economy. Millions of Russians now, thanks to defense spending, have risen into the middle class. No social safety net needed. And while wars are won on the battlefield, they're also won on the home front. If the invasion of Ukraine becomes unpopular, then it's harder for Russian generals to succeed. It now looks, however, it now looks like Putin can keep this war going for at least two more years because this invasion is making life better for Russians who don't have to actually fight it. Well, we're talking about war, and war is about killing. That's why I'm against war. That's why most of us are against all war. But surrendering to Putin doesn't make you a pacifist. It makes you suicidal. I've noticed the pro-Putin wing inside the Republican Party and pro-Putin right-wingers here in America are now fancying themselves as peace activists. But they're anything but. Because Russia invaded Ukraine. Only Russians get to be the peace activists the same way America invaded Iraq, and only Americans got to be peace activists. You don't get to support the invading nation and then insist you're all about peace, love, and understanding because you think the country that has just been attacked should surrender. You're not a peace activist. You're a belligerent. Not everything is going swimmingly for Vladimir Putin. The BBC reports this morning that the Ukrainian invasion has been a meat grinder for Russian soldiers, with at least 50,000 killed since the invasion was first launched. This is a type of battlefield not seen since World War I. It's gruesome. The Russian army is lousy with deserters, and Putin has been forced to empty out his prisons to find able-bodied men willing to fight, and of course, mercenaries. More importantly, Russia is an occupying army. Conquering a people, and yes, the Ukrainians are a people, Conquering a people always proves deadly for the occupiers. The only thing worse than a World War I era type of battlefield is door-to-door, hand-to-hand combat. The occupied, well, they can stick around. They have to. They have no place to go. So they stay and fight. And that type of war normally degrades into guerrilla tactics and, of course, terrorism that lasts for decades. That being said, Russia is taking territory. Despite efforts from the West, Russia is not isolated. It's been able to sell oil, just not to us. It's also getting missiles from North Korea drones from Iran, as well as raw intelligence and raw material from China. As Republicans slow-walked the Ukraine supplemental, Ukraine 
began running low on air defenses, drones, shells, and armored vehicles. Winter is now over, and Russia's summer offensive could, some think, force Vladimir Zelensky to the bargaining table, where he might give up Crimea and all of the Donbass region. The Minsk Accords. But will that be enough for Vladimir Putin? History is littered with peace treaties that only buy the aggressor more time to reload, restock, and then come back to take it all. Ask this country's Native Americans about peace treaties. Putin believes Ukraine isn't just a part of Russia. He believes it is Russia. According to his mythology, Russia, the Russian-speaking people, the Russian culture, is incomplete unless Ukraine gets absorbed into it as one. Putin has made it abundantly clear that this invasion isn't about reconfiguring the old Soviet Union and creating a tight-knit federation of semi-autonomous independent republics. This isn't about making Ukraine part of a modern-day Warsaw Pact, where Ukraine points due east when it comes to trade and defense. No, Ukraine, according to Putin, is Russia and always has been Russia. Putin says it's not an independent nation. Putin believes Ukraine is not an integral part of the Russian people. Ukraine is the Russian people. He doesn't see Ukraine as a buffer for Russia. He sees it as Russia. So, tomorrow, the House of Representatives is finally supposed to vote on this Ukraine supplemental. Many believe this is a pivotal moment in world history. This is why we should pay attention. Many believe Saturday could go down as the turning point. Will America, specifically the Republicans, allow Ukraine to fall? What do you think? Leave a comment. I read all your comments. Do you think Ukraine can win without American support? Do you think Europe has the capability to equip Ukraine the same way Russia can equip itself? Do you think Putin would ever agree to just keeping the Donbass region and Crimea and not try to absorb all of Ukraine into Mother Russia? What does history tell you about people like Putin. What has Putin said about Ukraine? And why would you believe he could ever be satisfied with just pieces of it? More importantly, is it now too late? Even if the Ukraine supplemental does pass tomorrow, will history say it was too late? Since August, Joe Biden has been trying to get the supplemental passed. And what happens now that Israel retaliated today and launched an air attack on Iran? If Iran attacks again, as it did early Sunday morning, lobbing 300 missiles into Israel, does that mean Iran is now willing to venture into a full-scale war with Israel? And if so, that means Iran will no longer be able to supply drones to Russia. So, does Ukraine benefit from a war between Israel and Iran? We are now getting reports that Iran claims to have shot down three Israeli attack drones over the Iranian city of Isfahan, which is home to several military installations. Meanwhile, in northern Israel, air raid sirens 
are sounding as tensions mount with Hezbollah, the Iranian paramilitary organization stationed along southern Lebanon. Nine are dead, 15 missing, and several wounded after Israeli airstrikes struck a Palestinian refugee camp just west of Gaza City. And the United States yesterday used its veto power to block a U.N. resolution granting Palestine full U.N. membership. Now, on Saturday, besides the Ukraine supplemental, the House is also expected to vote on aid to Israel. The progressive wing of the Democratic Party is breaking ranks with the Biden administration and promising to vote against sending more military assistance to Israel because of the IDF's decision to level Gaza in response to October 7th. But now, with Iran and Israel exchanging missile attacks, how many Democrats will continue their plan to vote against Israel on Saturday? This is the mop-up for April 19th, 2024. I'm David Feldman in New York City. Thank you so much for finding me. Please like this episode so I remain in your feed. And of course, always leave a comment. I want to know what you think. Thank you to my listeners. I read your comments and you have informed me the son of Sam's real name was Harvey. I didn't know that. The dog, who was referred to as the son of Sam, was actually named Harvey. And that's where I think all the trouble started. You don't name a dog Harvey. In fact, if I were named Harvey, I'd tell my crazy neighbor to go on a killing spree too. Harvey is not a dog's name. Would you name your son Spot? Would you name your daughter Fluffy? Stop giving your animals human names. It's perverse, and it makes them sick in the head. Yesterday, Mike Johnson, for the first time in his six months serving as Speaker, publicly declared support for Ukraine and broke with Donald Trump and Putin by saying, unless Russia is defeated in Ukraine, Russia will march through Eastern Europe. Johnson's remarks were uncharacteristically sober regarding America's role in the world as he pivoted yesterday dramatically away from the isolationist America First streak he and his Republican colleagues have expressed since even before Putin invaded. Johnson said yesterday... It's imperative that his Congress provide what he called lethal aid to Ukraine. That's what Johnson said, lethal aid to Ukraine. Johnson said the war in Ukraine is a crucial moment in world history. All of a sudden, he realizes this. For six months, he's been speaker. Johnson then attempted to strike a profile in courage by acknowledging that he would be able to keep his speakership if he walked away from the Ukraine supplemental. But Johnson said that would be selfish, and it's more important that I do the right thing for the world than for myself. Took him six months to say this. Johnson added, if I operated out of fear of a motion to vacate the chair, I would never be able to do my job, unquote. That implies he ever was able to do his job. Mike Johnson has accomplished absolutely nothing. This is the single most unproductive Congress in American history. That's a fact. He can't do his job. He has only been able to pass three spending bills through suspension because he needs Democrats to get it through. More Democrats have voted for Mike Johnson's spending bills than Republicans. 
All Mike Johnson has accomplished is impeaching Homeland Security Director Alejandro Mayorkas. And that died two days ago in the Senate. Because Johnson is Speaker, he is also a member of the Gang of Eight, a select number of House members trusted with high-level classified security briefings from our nation's top intelligence agencies. Johnson yesterday seemed to have broken ranks with the pro-Putin wing of the GOP and told reporters he believes what Joe Biden's intelligence agencies are saying. He believes what those intelligence agencies are telling him. No doubt those reports Johnson is receiving tell the story of thousands of Ukrainian children kidnapped by Russian soldiers and dragged into Russia in what is being described as a horrific war crime of ethnic cleansing. No doubt, Johnson believes the high-level security briefings telling him Ukraine is not run by Nazis or that Putin didn't invade to rescue Ukrainian Christians from persecution. These are talking points spewed repeatedly by members of his own caucus, especially the odious Marjorie Taylor Greene, whose motion to vacate the chair is currently languishing in committee, but she warns she will refile it as privileged, forcing a vote in two days if Johnson goes ahead with his decision to allow a vote on the Ukraine supplemental. It's looking like Mike Johnson is keeping his word. There's going to be a vote. Is Marjorie Taylor Greene going to keep her word and file a motion, a privileged motion, for him to vacate the chair? Or will Johnson's pimp, Donald Trump, pick up a phone and tell Marjorie to back off? It's essential that we all remember the votes are there in the House for this Ukrainian supplemental to pass. Those votes have been there for six months. And the only thing keeping the Ukraine supplemental from ever getting passed has been an opportunity to vote on it. Now, six months as Speaker, since August Biden has been trying to get a vote. Now, there's going to be a vote on Saturday, we think. Mike Johnson warned on Thursday that she, China's leader, and the Iranians are assisting Russia's invasion of Ukraine, providing it with war material, adding that China, Iran, and Russia now comprise the new axis of evil. Sound familiar? Earlier in the week, Johnson called himself a wartime speaker. Sound familiar? Now he's calling Russia, China, and Iran the axis of evil. He's a wartime speaker. All it takes is Mike Johnson insisting Iraq was behind 9-11, and he's gone full George W. Bush on us. In his comments supporting the Ukraine supplemental, Mike Johnson added a personal touch, reminding reporters that his own son is about to join the Naval Academy in the fall. He said, for his family, like so many Americans with sons and daughters serving in our military, the situation in Ukraine is, quote, not a game. He said, this is not a joke. His son is about to start serving in the military, and I hope his son meets Eric and Don Jr., because they would have a lot in common. They're older, but they served in Iraq. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm confusing them with Uday and Kuse, Saddam Hussein's drug-addled sons. My mistake. They did not serve our country. So, has Mike Johnson finally found his voice? Is he going to stand up 
to Trump and Putin. I could not believe the words coming out of Mike Johnson's mouth yesterday. He warned Vladimir Putin will not stop with Ukraine. He says Russia is eyeing the Balkans as well as Poland, Poland which shares a border with Ukraine. What's going on? We know Johnson was down in Mar-a-Lago last week. We know he coordinates his every move with Trump. We know Johnson is a world-class election denier who not only slapped his name on an amicus brief back in 2020 challenging the presidential election in a case before the Supreme Court, but as recently as a week ago, he lied once again and said most of the people arrested on January 6th were simply wandering the Capitol with no intent to do any harm. Certainly, when he met with Trump last week, they must have hatched a plan on how to handle this Ukraine supplemental. I suspect, and this is conjecture, that there's a pretty good chance Johnson assured Trump that I'm going to support the Ukraine supplemental, but don't worry, Mr. President, I'll make sure it never gets out of the Rules Committee. And I suspect when he told that to Donald Trump, he believed that. I suspect that was Johnson's plan a week ago. Yesterday, however, he sounded awfully convincing, as though he might have had a come-to-Jesus moment for the first time in his life. Mike Johnson has never had a come-to-Jesus moment. Mike Johnson only has Jesus comes to Mike Johnson moments, where Jesus tells him, that's not what I said, and Mike Johnson says, I do not care. Mike Johnson is a vicious, mean-spirited liar who hears voices in his head. But it now looks like the Ukraine supplemental has made it out of the Rules Committee, and the rules surrounding the vote on the Ukraine supplemental will be voted on later today by the full House. I'm not going to pretend to understand parliamentary procedure. All I can tell you is the Ukraine supplemental did not get tied up in the Rules Committee the way Johnson most assuredly promised Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin that it would. At the very last minute, late Thursday night, the Rules Committee voted 9-3 to three to send the rules regarding how the supplemental can be voted on to the floor for a full House vote. If the rules pass today, that means the supplemental will be voted on Saturday. And the rules are expected to pass later today. It's six months, not too late. We don't know if it's too late, but this should have been six months ago. But it is impressive. Again, Mike Johnson is a vicious mean-spirited liar who hears voices in his head. But maybe, maybe he's finally getting some of the job done, or at least trying. I'm a little naive and good-hearted, and I like to think the best of homophobic, daughter-sniffing, racist, intolerant, bigoted backwater hicks from Louisiana, like Mike Johnson, whose mother should have performed a late-term abortion on his Johnson so he couldn't bring any more of his kind into this world. I do. I can't help it. I'm an optimist. I like to see the best in human excrement like Mike Johnson. I think people are capable of doing good. Someone like Mike 
Johnson, who's dragging this entire country into the Middle Ages, I think he's capable of doing good. To Mike Johnson's credit, again, this carbuncle on a snake's scrotum, earlier this year, Mike Johnson got Congress to pass a, uh, an extension of expanding the child tax credit. It's now dying in the Senate. And because April 15th has come and gone, it's unlikely to be revived anytime soon. But this ring of bloody stool clinging to an overflowing portisan, Mike Johnson, did get it passed in the House. And we all know that before the child tax credit expansion lapsed in late 2021, it had lifted more people out of poverty since LBJ's Great Society. So you got to give credit to somebody like Mike Johnson and then get rid of him. So what is Trump's official position on the Ukraine supplemental? What is it? What is he telling Republicans? Well, Trump got back from court on Wednesday and hosted Polish President Andrzej Duda. The Polish president was in town to serve as the keynote speaker at the Javis Center for Lightbulb 2024. Lightbulb 2024 is in Manhattan this year, and Polish President Andrzej Duda uh, showed up. Lightbulb 2024 is an annual event celebrating scientific advances in the fastening of incandescent lamps into light bulb sockets. Anyway, Polish President Duda represents Poland's Law and Order Party, which aligns itself with Trump. And <laughs> I have to, sorry. How am I doing on time here? Ah. Light bulb. 2024. <laughs> Polish president was in town for light bulb. 2024. Um, Polish president Duda represents Poland's law and order party, which aligns itself with Trump and Viktor Orban's authoritarian anti-LGBTQ Christian nationalists. He's a piece of shit. His party has restricted freedom of press, same-sex marriage, and abortion rights, prompting many to call Poland an illiberal democracy. However, it's important to note that the real power in Poland does not reside with the president, whose term expires next year. The real power wielded is with Poland's prime minister, who is, and I'm not making this up, Donald Tusk. That's Polish Prime Minister Donald Tusk. Seen here asking why the ice cream cone he was just handed tastes and smells like other people's breath and saliva. I don't think uh, that's an ice cream cone. Anyway, Donald Tusk is a good guy. He's the prime minister recently elected. He represents the Civic Coalition Party, which is pro-democracy, pro-LGBTQ rights, and is way more to the center than the Polish president's party. Trump's meeting with the Polish president Wednesday, therefore, was mostly ceremonial since the only power the Polish president possesses is the ability to veto legislation, but he has little to no say in the day-to-day -day running of the parliament the way the more liberal prime minister of Poland does. Poland was becoming authoritarian, and with their new prime minister, Donald Tusk, uh, 
they are moving to uh, the center. Again, that is Donald Tusk. Tusk is a Polish word meaning my mother is a walrus. So with Poland facing a possible attack from Putin, what did Donald Trump have to say about the big Ukraine supplemental after meeting with the Polish president yesterday? What did he have to say? So far, Trump has succeeded in getting Mike Johnson to stall passage of the Ukraine supplemental, right? Six months. And Ukraine, because of that, has begun to lose. We know Putin would be furious if Trump ever supported giving arms to Ukraine. Trump's plan has always been to delay the supplemental for as long as possible so that Ukraine continues to lose ground, and then when Trump gets back into the Oval Office, Trump will announce he supports a peace plan that gives Vladimir Putin everything he wants, which is all of Ukraine. That has been Donald Trump's plan. Delay, delay, delay. The more I can get Mike Johnson to delay the supplemental, the more ground Putin takes. But world events are shifting faster than Trump can control them. And Trump, he can't placate Putin by behaving like Marjorie Taylor Greene and start parroting grotesque Russian talking points about Ukraine and Zelensky that are all lies. This is what Marjorie Taylor Greene is now doing. If Trump were to claim Ukraine is run by Nazis, that Ukraine is persecuting Christians, or that Ukraine belongs to Russia, he would automatically lose the support of Wall Street which wants Ukraine to join the West since Ukraine has the potential to become one of Europe's and America's largest trading partners. Trump has to placate the hedge fund managers and people like Jamie Dimon who want Ukraine drawn into the West. He's got to choose between Wall Street and Putin. So, on Wednesday, Trump found a way to stake out a position without offending his paymaster, Vladimir Putin. Instead of ordering House Republicans to vote against the supplemental, he can't do that, he complained that NATO members are to blame for Ukraine losing He said NATO members are to blame for not spending enough to protect Ukraine. Trump said Ukraine is Europe's problem more than it's America's. He then said, so why aren't the NATO members doing more? He complained that NATO, which he wants to pull out of, NATO needs to demand that member states spend 3% of their GDP each year on defense instead of the 2% they're required to spend now. That was the agreement that he and President Duda of Poland came up with, that member nations of NATO have to spend 3% of their GDP, not 2%. Well, Europe has stepped up, and the EU has approved close to $60 billion in military aid for Ukraine. Countries like Germany and Sweden, which just joined, they've increased their arms production factories to full capacity. Great Britain and France are also trying to fill the gap left by America's inaction on the supplemental, inaction since August. Biden has been trying to get this supplemental passed since August. And Europe, no matter how hard it tries, 
doesn't possess America's war-making machinery. We spend more on defense than the 20 countries below us combined, including Russia. But Europe is trying. French President Emmanuel Macron has gone so far as to suggest his country would be willing to send troops, to put troops, boots on the ground in Ukraine to fight the Russians. This is the same France that refused to participate in America's illegal invasion of Iraq. It's interesting to see, you know, if you have trouble deciding, and if you've been a longtime listener to this show, you know I haven't been, I haven't had certitude about this, this war. But I pay attention to what Bernie says to what Elizabeth Warren says, and they help shape my world view. Since first taking, and I pay attention to what Jimmy Dore says, or Jackson Hinkle says, and I think, well, if they're rooting for Putin and so is Tucker Carlson, okay. If Marjorie Taylor Greene is rooting for Putin, That informs my decision-making. Since first taking office, Donald Trump has insisted he wants to pull out of NATO because that's precisely what Vladimir Putin wants. And I keep hearing that Donald Trump, if elected in his first 100 days, would yank America out of NATO. But that's impossible. He can't. So anybody who who's saying that Trump is going to yank us out of NATO, he can't. At least not unilaterally. Uh, NATO is a treaty, and treaties are approved and or broken by our Senate. And just to be on the safe side, last December the Senate introduced a bipartisan bill sponsored by Democrat Tim Kaine and Republican Marco Rubio, they sit on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. They introduced, and it was signed into law, a bill forbidding any president from pulling out of NATO unilaterally without permission from the Senate. So Trump won't be able to pull us out of NATO, no matter how much Putin tells him to, unless he gets a filibuster-proof Senate. What is Trump's political gambit vis-a-vis Ukraine? This is an election year, and he knows the Ukraine supplemental that's going to get voted on Saturday, we hope. He knows it's popular, but just barely. When Russia invaded Two years ago, most Americans supported the Biden administration's efforts to arm Ukraine. In that first year, two-thirds of Americans said they supported Ukraine, no doubt partly because of a Cold War sense memory that trained a large swath of older Americans to instinctively distrust Russia. But conservative media in the service of Vladimir Putin, got to work. And they quietly began trashing Ukraine and pumping up Putin as a white Christian nationalist who shares Republican values. And so, while overall support for Ukraine here in America remains strong, thanks to Russian propaganda propagated by Tucker Carlson and low-rent podcasters like Jimmy Dore, whose attention span is so short he needs a bookmark to read a fortune cookie, thanks to people like him, support for Ukraine has begun to decline here in America. From the polling I've seen, 
a majority of Americans still support giving more weapons to Ukraine. A majority of Americans support this Ukraine supplemental. And that's what Trump is paying attention to. But, but, according to a new CBS News poll, support for the supplemental is down to 53%. While it's only 53%, politically speaking, 53% still puts the pro-Putin wing of the GOP on the wrong side of this issue. And Trump gets that. He has to win in November, or he's going away. 74% of Democrats right now support the supplemental. But 61% of Republicans are against it. And 69% of Trump supporters are opposed to it. So 69% of MAGA supporters basically want Putin to win. 61% of Republicans are pro-Putin. So Donald Trump is being cagey here. You know, for a guy who has impulse control issues, uh, who blurts out uh, things that he wishes he doesn't say, In many ways, he's often pretty adept at parsing words. And he's cagey. On the issue of Ukraine, it's not what Trump says. It's what he doesn't say. And what he hasn't said is, I support the Ukraine supplemental. What he has never said is Vladimir Putin was wrong for invading Ukraine. When the invasion first happened, every Western leader on both sides of the aisle, including Viktor Orban, said Putin was wrong for invading Ukraine. Not Donald Trump. Over at Reuters, I was reading Reuters this morning, I was reminded that during a CNN town hall last year, Trump refused to say whether he wanted Ukraine or Russia to win the war. He could not bring himself to say Vladimir Putin was wrong for invading and like every other Western leader on both sides of the political spectrum, I am rooting for Zelensky. I am rooting for Ukraine. He would not say that. But tell me again how Russiagate was garbage. Tell me again, my my Democratic friends who hate Hillary Clinton, Let me hear again, Russia, 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 how that was all BS. We know Trump is rooting for Putin for variegated reasons, but he would never say that. Again, it's what Trump doesn't say. Marjorie Taylor Greene, on the other hand, is saying it. She is now openly rooting for Putin, calling him the defender of Christians, who she insists are being persecuted by the Nazis in Ukraine. And if Marjorie Taylor Greene says that, it means Trump thinks that. It means he wants her to say it. It means Marjorie Taylor Greene is articulating precisely what the pro-Putin wing of the GOP doesn't have the cojones to say 
out loud. But Trump knows, given the polling, he's got a win in November. More importantly, given the pro-Ukrainian consensus among his donors, it would be political suicide if word ever got out that he told Mike Johnson to kill the Ukraine supplemental the same way he ordered Johnson to kill the bipartisan border bill. Reuters says this morning that Trump's call on Wednesday to increase NATO's member state spending from 2% to 3% has been perceived by some Republicans as a dog whistle, signaling to both Putin, Mike Johnson, and House Republicans that he does not support the Ukraine supplemental. Again, on Wednesday, he said, the survival of Ukraine is way more important to Europe than it is to the United States. So why should we bear the burden of the costs? And then he pivoted and blamed Joe Biden for all of this, insisting Ukraine wouldn't be in this mess if I, Donald Trump, were still president. Dog whistles. People heard dog whistles. The Republicans, the pro-Putin wing of the House, were led to believe that that statement was a veiled message telling them not to vote for the Ukraine supplemental. But Trump surprised everyone on Wednesday. And for the first time since the invasion, Donald Trump actually said Ukraine's survival is important to America's security interests. This is incredible that he said that. This is the first time he's defied Putin when it comes to Ukraine. Why why did he say that? Was it the extra dose of horse tranquilizer he's taken to remain calm in court? Was it the horse tranquilizer talking, or does he really mean that? I don't know. Republican Congressman Don Bacon of Nebraska on C-SPAN yesterday warned there are too many House Republicans now openly rooting for Vladimir Putin. This, as Speaker Johnson tries to to get a $60 billion supplemental out of the Rules Committee and onto the floor for a vote. Looks like he's, they've gone over that, looks like he has. Congressman Don Bacon, Republican of Nebraska, warned that if the Ukraine supplemental fails on Saturday, it will only be a matter of time before Russia takes Kiev. Bacon warned the Ukrainians are all out of artillery. Bacon's warning about members of his Republican caucus spouting Putin propaganda and rooting for Russia echoes identical warnings from Mike Turner, the Republican chair of the House Intelligence Committee, and Mike McCall, the Republican chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and outgoing Colorado Republican Ken Buck, who calls Marjorie Taylor Greene Moscow Marjorie. There are Republican chairmen of House committees speaking out against Republicans who are not just parroting pro-Putin propaganda, but openly rooting for Putin. Bacon didn't mention Marjorie Taylor Greene by name. Ken Buck has, and it bears repeating. She has already filed a motion 
for Mike Johnson to vacate the chair. It's currently languishing in the Rules Committee. But she has specifically warned Mike Johnson, if you bring the Ukraine supplemental to the floor for a vote, I will file my motion as privileged. And that means the House has two days to vote on a motion for you to vacate. And right now, the same way the Ukraine supplemental is most likely going to pass on Saturday, so would a motion for Mike Johnson to vacate. He is not beloved. Many people believe, because he's not good at making it rain, getting the campaign contributions, the DCCC is outperforming his fundraising attempts. Uh, A lot of people, he's going to do worse on a motion to vacate than Kevin McCarthy would, and Kevin McCarthy was despised. Marjorie Taylor Greene isn't backing down. When she heard that Mike Johnson is pushing ahead with the Ukraine supplemental, on Thursday she said, quote, people are really done with Johnson's BS. So, is Mike Johnson gone after Saturday's vote? What happens? Will we have a new speaker and with a one-vote majority? Could it be Hakeem Jeffries? Or will Hakeem Jeffries keep his promise and, and support Mike Johnson? Mike Johnson is bringing the vote to the floor. He kept his word. And Hakeem Jeffries, the Democratic minority leader, said, signaled, if there are no poison pills in this supplemental, if it's a clean bill, when they come for you, when your party comes for you, I got your back. We'll vote for you to be speaker. There was talk early Thursday morning among the Republican leadership about changing the rules governing how a speaker can be removed. When Nancy Pelosi was Speaker of the House, only leaders from both parties were allowed to file a motion for the Speaker to vacate the chair. But back in January of 2023, when the Republicans took control of the House, Kevin McCarthy was elected Speaker after 15 painful rounds. He picked up a lot of resistance from the far-right Freedom Caucus. So, one of the compromises that Kevin McCarthy had to make in order to win over some of the hard-right members of that caucus, one of the compromises he made was agreeing to change the rules when it comes to vacating the chair. It changed from Pelosi's rule where only the House leadership from both parties can file a motion to vacate. He changed the rule so that any single member of the House of Representatives can file a motion to vacate the chair. And according to this rule, the House then has two days to convene and vote on whether the Speaker should give up his gavel. It's what did him in. Matt Gates and the, the crazy eight, Matt Gates and seven other Republicans made him go. Johnson kept that rule in place. As it became increasingly obvious that with his one-vote majority, Johnson was going to be curb-stomped for the Ukraine supplemental, he and the Republican leaders began floating the idea of attaching an amendment to the Ukraine supplemental. And that amendment would change the rules governing removal 
of the speaker. There was brief talk on Thursday of an amendment that would require more than one House member. Uh, Instead, it would require a set of multiple members to uh, bring a motion to vacate. Such a rule change would defang renegade attention-seeking Republicans like Matt Gates and now Marjorie Taylor Greene. Gates said he would vote against any rule change that raises the number of House members required to trigger a motion to vacate. He did say, however, he would consider the rule change if it were coupled with a rule limiting the ability of House members to trade individual stocks. So this was being talked about briefly on Thursday, and it sparked a rebellion among the Republicans. By mid-afternoon Thursday, Mike Johnson was forced to reverse course and say, I I wasn't thinking about changing any rules regarding motions to vacate the chair. Well, it got pretty tense and ugly on the House floor. You might want to watch it on C-SPAN. Several hard right conservatives walked up to him disrespectfully got in his face and they said to Mike Johnson their supposed leader if you change the rules regarding motions to vacate we're going to push for your removal right now before you even get the Ukraine supplemental out of the rules committee and to make sure the hard right knew I got the message Johnson immediately took to Twitter and declared, we will continue to govern under the existing rules. So, as of early this morning, with the sun rising here in Manhattan, it looks like the House, this Friday morning, is about to vote on the rules regarding the Ukraine supplemental. As of this morning, we are being told it will pass, which means tomorrow, Saturday, we will see an actual vote on the $61 billion Ukraine supplemental, and we are being told it will pass. Then, all that remains to be seen is... Was the supplemental passed six months too late? And if so, if Ukraine falls, there is one person and one person alone to blame. Only one person can be held accountable if Ukraine falls. Mike Johnson, he had six months to introduce this supplemental. He waited until the very last minute. And did he do so on purpose in the service of Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump? That remains to be seen. I'm David Feldman, reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. Thank you so much for listening to me this early Friday morning. I like doing the show first thing in the morning. Kind of interesting. I don't think I'm going to do a show on uh, Saturday. We'll see. There's a lot going on. There's just too much news which is good because it energizes me. There's a lot going on. I hardly touched um, the meal. There's so much going on. If you enjoyed any of this, please like this so I remain in your feed, please. Leave comments. I read all your comments. Unless you're a MAGA moron, you're forbid. If If you're a Trump supporter or a Republican, 
your people are not welcome here. We don't serve your kind. No shirt, no shoes, no brain cells, no service. Not interested in what you have to say. Please subscribe to this channel, of course. Please subscribe to my newsletter. Did I cover every... Oh, did we get... I'm sorry. I'm doing a new thing here where I look at uh, Super Chats. Did I get any? Okay, no Super Chats. Thank you all for being here, and maybe tomorrow, depending how I feel. Thank you all.